Now I welcome Professor Niels Morling from Denmark for his speech on use of forensic genetic investigations to ensure justice. Please, sir, Professor Niels Morling. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here for the IMSELF meeting and to be here in Dhaka. It's my first time in Bangladesh and it's very interesting for me. So um, I come from Copenhagen, Denmark, and I'm a professor at the university in Copenhagen and in another Danish university in a smaller city called Aalborg. And here you see a world map with Bangladesh and Denmark, the small country, but part of the kingdom is also the Faroe Islands and Greenland. And we are serving all these parts of Denmark with forensic genetics. So um, it's easy to serve Denmark because it's a small country with only five, six million people and everything is working, good communication of any kind. And we have three universities that have institutes for forensic medicine. And with this, in Denmark, we mean all the biological uh, issues that are part of forensic medicine. So we're doing forensic pathology, chemistry, toxicology, and odontology, anthropology, in the universities, all three universities. But all forensic genetics is done in Copenhagen. So here you see the Faroe Islands. It's a little bit more difficult to come up to the Faroe Islands because there's a lot of uh, clouds and may be difficult to fly up and land there. And Greenland is very difficult, especially in the winter time, because there's such so much ice and it's so cold and it's difficult to come from one place to another. And here you see our building in Copenhagen where we have these disciplines and um, here you see the number of cases and we also do a lot of research and teaching in forensic medicine. Um, and our research programs is here and we have um, a lot of work with practical uh, things, development of things with new technologies, etc., etc. And we do also some genetic uh, research of diseases, uh, especially sudden cardiac deaths, because this is a pr problem uh, in a modern forensic pathology department because now and then we, we have these difficulties in finding out what uh, was the manner of death and the cause of death. For example, the young person who f is found um, under strange circumstances and then it turns out at the end of the day when we do DNA investigation that this was a case with a genetic disease that caused the death. And we do some epigenetic uh, investigations and here we include messenger RNA and microRNA and isolated DNA. And we use it for tissue identification, age estimation, and genetic heart diseases mainly for the time being. So now let's go to uh, the crime cases. So um, here you have an example with biological stain material and DNA changed a lot for us. And here you see Alec Jeffries and the first examples of DNA investigations that he did that could be used for forensic genetic purposes. And it was published in 1985 and you can go back to, back to this old uh, article. So how do we do forensic genetic investigations in Denmark? Well, we use PCR and capillary elytrophoresis, and the outcome is 16 autosomal SGRs and also sex determinations uh, with amelogenin. If it's not enough, in rare cases it's not enough, then we will use um, massively parallel sequencing. Uh, there's a kit from uh, Thermo Fisher, which will give us a lot of SNP, autosomal SNPs and Y chromosome SNPs, and in many cases that would be uh, sufficient. We can also do Y chromosome STR typing, it's maybe a little bit easier, or mitochondrial uh, sequencing. 
and nowadays we will do it with massively parallel sequencing, and maybe you call, call it the next generation sequencing. And we also have crime databases, and as most cases in countries. And the first one is, was in the USA, and the next year the UK came, came in, and we were a little bit slower in Denmark. We started that in the year 2000, and the reason for being so slow were a lot of ethical considerations. And um, in an Interpol review, we saw in 2002 that many, many countries had established these uh, DNA databases for crime investigations. And in 2005, um, the European Union uh, started a common databasing. So seven countries from the EU agreed on collaboration on crime DNA database data. And some years later, all the EU member states, that was maybe 15 states at that time, agreed to uh, collaborate. And in 2012, um, it was agreed that accreditation was mandatory for participation in the EU crime DNA uh, based uh, database col collaboration. And it has been a great success. Here you have some figures from various countries, and you can see that Denmark, uh, to the right, has a, a very high success rate. That is 31 in the parentheses. But the other countries have, of course, large, much larger database bases, and it's a very efficient tool. And there are some details which I will skip. Now we will go for to paternity testing and relationship testing. And here you can see some children looking for a father. And it may be a little bit difficult to find out what, what is a father because you can have biological fathership. And here you see my wife and my biological son. And here you see another boy. Where does he come from? He comes from Sri Lanka. He's adopted. We adopted him some years ago. What about him? He's Chinese, isn't he, Henry? No, he's from Korea. <laughs> I'm sorry. Next time it will be Chinese, maybe. <laughs> so, yes, can I do that? <laughs> he's 12 years young, younger than me, no, older. <laughs> no, okay, so how do we do this? Well, our standard procedure is the same as in crime cases. We would like to use the same methods if possible. It's easier and it's more stable. And then we usually start out in paternity and relationship testing for maybe one year to learn all the tricks and learn all, or at least the majority of the pitfalls. Sometimes it's not enough. So in these cases, we nowadays will do massively parallel sequencing and it's very efficient. Now I will go to some other new things. Ancestry, geography, physical traits and age, and how it can be used, the perspectives in crime and identification cases. And it's especially uh, important in crime cases where we have no match with any suspect or any DNA profile in crime DNA databases. So what do we do? Well, these new methods have given us a lot of possibilities. So we can actually have information concerning ancestry, physical traits, and age, uh, and it can give valuable investigative leads in crime and identification cases. So let's start with the ancestry informature markers. There are many markers. The most efficient are the autosomal markers, but we uh, can also use the lineage markers. These are the uh, haplogroups of mitochondrial DNA and YSTRs. In special cases, it will be very valuable. And there are different kinds of uh, markers, single nucleotide polymorphisms markers, SNPs, indels, insertion deletions, and um, we have now analyzed several hundred markers that can be used uh, in ancestry uh, prediction. And we can definitely make continental resolution uh, with these autosomal SNPs East Asia, Europe, Africa, etc., that can be recognized with our methods. 
Um, and now, in these years, final resolution is actually emerging. So now we can actually also identify, for, for example, what we call South Central uh, Asian uh, individuals, that includes Bangladesh people, Pakistani people, and Indian people. The first time it was really used in um, a crime case investigation was in a terror attack in Madrid. It was a bomb attack and there were some questions about um, the people who were involved in this. Uh, and uh, some of these people were not identified. And then our colleagues in Santiago de Compostela used SNP typing for prediction of age of these unidentified individuals. So ancestry and geography is uh, very closely um, related to each other. Um, and so are, of course, also phenotypical traits. So if you were going to uh, predict this, I have three populations here, or representatives, and you are Asian. So can you please tell me where do these people come from? They come from three different uh, areas. Middle one is Japanese. So the left, the left one is from Japan, middle one from China, and the right one from Korea. <laughs> and now we have some African people, and I can tell you, you see to the left, West African people, in the middle, North, West African people, and to the right, North, East people, North Af African people, like Somalia. And here you see some European people, and that may be difficult for you. To the left you see a Danish person, in the middle you see a European person, Eastern European person, and to the right you see a South Spanish person. So all these predictions are very difficult when we come to the fine details. So here you see a lot of women from various countries, and it is for me, very difficult to say exactly from which country. So we have to be humble when we do this, and we also have to be humble when we go to the DNA typing. And see, here you see the men, and it is not easier for me, at least. So now we'll go to physical traits. And here we have um, an investigation of eye color and hair color. And there is a a set of markers that can be used for this and there has been developed a tool, a statistical tool that can show us um, the most likely um, color of the eye and the hair based on DNA investigations. And now it has also been extended with prediction of the color of the skin. And here you see some examples and I will not go into details about this but it's also a very weak prediction compared to other kinds of, it, of identification with DNA. But it's useful and valuable, to some extent at least. We will go to morphology of the face. And nowadays that can also roughly be um, predicted by DNA uh, investigations. Um, and there are some principles about this. And here you see uh, some of these things that can be well recognized and be digitized <clears throat> so that you can use it uh, in mathematical analysis of, the, of your data. And here you see um, Manfred Kaiser who published a lot of these things um, and his face was actually um, in some way correlated uh, to some um, SNP variants and it was actually reasonably good. You can see some clustering and you can see that the clustering are not very clear, but there are clusterings. So this is a step towards having a much better prediction of uh, the facial characteristics with SNPs. So now we are in a position where we actually have the possibility to buy kits that to some extent can predict hair color and eye color and ancestry. And here we have Frederick, this is one of my co-workers, and we have a photo of him as a child. And when he is investigated with this kid from Illumina, uh, you will see here that um, 
He is predicted to be a European person with his kit and most likely his eye color, or no, most likely his, his hair color is blonde and uh, the eye color is definitely blue. And with another kit, which is from Thermo Fisher, you can see here that he is um, a North West European person by this prediction. But now, remember that DNA predicted that his hair color most likely would be blonde and it fit with the color when he was a boy. This is how he looks today. His hair color changed. So be careful when you do these things. There are things that we do not know yet. We are working on it and I don't think it will take too many years before we find out what is going on. But we have, there's nobody who has a clue to this yet. So now let's go to how to evaluate the weight of these uh, DNA findings, especially in the purpose of helping to prevent crime and find out who did it and paternity. So I, I'm very much in favor of using the likelihood ratio thing uh, idea to uh, describe the weight of the evidence. Yeah. And all kinds of uh, fair evidence can be giving weights in this way, at least in theory. I know that sometimes it's very difficult. So what is the principle? Well, we have, maybe have some small weights that you compare with some heavy or strong weights. So we have this balance and then it will go down to the side where you have the strongest uh, evidence. And we express it, it's a probability thing, a likelihood thing, and we express it as a ratio because there are two things that are going to be compared here. So when we're using genetic information, uh, we use information from the individual who we are investigating and we use um, the genetic information from the population that we are studying. And then in this way we will have a likely ratio. And you will see in many cases that the DNA work and the results are is expressed as a likely ratio with, which is very high, maybe 1,000 to 1 or 1 million to 1. And some people think that they can do it with, to 1 billion to 1. So it's maybe very, very strong evidence, but it's not always that way. So we have to look at the figure. So now we can uh, interpret. Okay. Um, so when we interpret the uh, DNA evidence, um, we can use verbal expression, for example, match it's him or we can make calculations of the probability of a random man not excluded but I would recommend that we use likelihood ratio uh, based on the exact probabilities dropout uh, probabilities can be uh, included which is a good thing and um, allele, allele uh, sizes reflecting DNA amounts can also be included and automated evaluation of DNA profiles and interpretation with special software is necessary in these cases. Uh, now, um, we may, with normal DNA investigations, have very good evidence, very strong evidence, but with some investigations of, for example, DNA ancestry, the weight is only limited. And the same is uh, the case with uh, these uh, DNA phenotyping uh, things. I've just had um, a note here that we are running out of time, so I will go to the last slides here I have. <coughs> so when we're doing uh, these things, we have to do think about the ethics about what we're doing. Um, but we also have to realize that ethical values vary among uh, various societies and cultures and <coughs> we still have to understand that acceptance and trust of the society uh, is important. It 
but it depends on social and ethical aspects such as uh, dignity, privacy and social uh, solidarity. Otherwise it will not work. Um, and of course the availability of investigations is very important. If you cannot do the investigations it's a very difficult situation. Um, we have to uh, f define the indications for sampling of biological materials and uh, the DNA examinations to make it work. And we also have to focus on the quality of the investigation and the fairness of these so that we can make trustworthy investigations. And the crime DNA database problem is a little bit difficult in some countries. And we have to think about who is included uh, and what is re the retention of the DNA profiles. What are the rules for this? And in Europe, um, we have the a hum human court, a uh, court of human rights. Uh, and in 2008, there was a decision on crime DNA databases where it said that the retention of fingerprints, cellular samples, and DNA in such circumstances is in breach of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, the right to respect free pri the privacy of family life. And this was a case where people in the UK were obviously innocent and had not nothing to do uh, with a crime case, the DNA was taken and uh, the samples and the DNA was and the information was um, retained in the UK database. And then they complained to the um, European Court of Human Rights and then uh, the Human Rights Court um, decided that uh, it was not in uh, accordance with Article 8. Um, The last thing is, when we do work with new DNA methods in forensic genetics, it's very important to be critical and do critical testing of the reliability, the sensitivity, the specificity, risk of contamination if you use PCR methods, and the weight of the evidence must be clearly defined. So be careful. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Niels Morning, for his nice speech on use of forensic genetic and investigation to ensure justice.